This Week at NASA. And we are now five minutes away from the targeted splashdown time of Dragon. The mission of the first commercial spacecraft to visit the International Space Station came to a successful conclusion with the return to Earth of the SpaceX Dragon capsule, which splashed down in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Baja, California. That capped off a nine-day trip during which Dragon demonstrated its ability to maneuver in orbit, safely approach the space station, and be grappled and berthed to the orbiting laboratory. We look forward to doing lots of lots more missions in the future and continuing to upgrade the technology and, and push the, uh, the, the frontier of space transportation. We've been waiting for this day and uh, it, it is certainly is a tremendous day. Uh, so we're looking forward now to, uh, to uh, routine uh, regular cargo services right. from you. Yeah. Congratulations on just an amazing, amazing mission. The SpaceX demonstration flight to the ISS is part of NASA's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services, or COTS program, which provides investments to stimulate the commercial space industry in America. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden was updated on the development of Orbital Sciences Corporation's Cygnus cargo carrier during a recent visit to the Wallops Flight Facility. Cygnus will carry supplies to the International Space Station under NASA's Cargo Resupply Services contract with Orbital. The first demonstration flight of the Cygnus is scheduled to launch from Wallops this fall aboard Orbital's Antares rocket. A new milestone has been reached for another commercial spacecraft designed to transport astronauts to low Earth orbit. Operations software for the Crew Space Transportation or CST-100 spacecraft under development by Boeing, has undergone its preliminary design review. The software is essential to all operational aspects of the spacecraft, including its launch, orbital maneuvering, docking, and landing. The CST-100, a capsule-shaped reusable spacecraft, will carry up to seven people or a combination of people and cargo to the International Space Station and elsewhere in low Earth orbit. The Atlas V rocket will propel the CST-100 on its initial test flights. And the Sierra Nevada Corporation's Dream Chaser spacecraft has passed a new milestone of its own. A test called a captive carry was performed successfully at Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport in Colorado. This test, used to validate ground and flight operations and flight characteristics of the Dream Chaser, employed an engineering test article and a sky crane helicopter. More validation testing is planned before the vehicle performs approach and landing tests. As for NASA's Space Launch System, engineers can now begin developing the heavy lift vehicle's flight software. Computers with testbed software have been delivered to the Marshall Space Flight Center by Boeing. The SLS will propel NASA's Orion spacecraft to destinations beyond low Earth orbit. NASA's Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, or New Star mission, scheduled to launch no earlier than June 13th from Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands, will use X-ray vision to hunt for hidden black holes. New Star will be opening up a new window on the universe. And although we are going into this mission with many scientific questions that we know New Star will provide the data that will give us the answers, like all of our NASA missions, we're going to find unexpected things out there that will lead us to questions and answers that we aren't even anticipating at this time. The New Star Observatory will be launched aboard Orbital Sciences Corporation's Pegasus rocket from the belly of the company's L-1011 Stargazer aircraft. New Star is a small explorer mission led by the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena and managed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We are here today to announce that for the very first time we've been able to measure the sideways motion in astronomy, also known as proper motion, of the Andromeda Galaxy. Scientists using the Hubble Space Telescope are predicting the next major cosmic event expected to affect our Milky Way galaxy, Sun and Solar System. We find that to within the precision of our measurements, the Andromeda Galaxy is heading straight in our direction. What this means is that the galaxies will collide. Scientists say the titanic collision between the Milky Way and Andromeda galaxies is expected to occur about 4 billion years from now and will ultimately result in the two galaxies merging to form a single elliptical galaxy. Even though it's billions of years in the future, it gives us some portrait of what the night sky will look like, uh, a really amazing event for whatever, you know, life exists on Earth at that time of, you know, 
things that will transpire in the cosmos in the future, and I think that's a very exciting thing for Hubble to be doing. I believe we have a very, very bright future, and you all are extremely critical to our success in leading the way in that future. NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver served as keynote speaker at a day-long conference outside Washington, D.C., sponsored by Women in Aerospace. The theme, Leading the Way, focused discussion on topics of special interest to women and those who hire, mentor, and promote them in aerospace worldwide. NASA is one of the top federal employers of STEM graduates. We have just over 20% of our STEM employees are women. I forget, are we 20% of the population, ladies? <laughs> Uh, remember, when we uh, invest in the space program, we are not putting money into space. Right? We spend that money right here on Earth. NASA Chief Technologist like Mason Peck and, uh, joined agency and Ohio officials at the Manufacturing Advocacy and Growth Network, or MAGNET, headquarters in Cleveland. There, Peck named nine small and medium-sized Ohio manufacturers who will receive NASA assistance to solve technical problems with their new or existing products. Those joining PEC included Glenn Research Center Director Ray Lugo. NASA is committed to providing 400 hours of technical assistance from its science and engineering workforce to help the selected companies solve specific technical challenges they're facing. In addition, the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County are making $450,000 in low interest rate loans available to the companies. This initiative is part of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policies Strong Cities, Strong Communities effort. NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver and White House Science and Technology Advisor John Holdren joined students and teachers from across the country for the Grail Mooncam Student Expo at Washington's Reagan Building and Trade Center. Mooncam, short for Moon Knowledge Acquired by Middle School Students, is an education and outreach program that includes a suite of cameras on NASA's moon orbiting Grail spacecraft that students can use to gather and study imagery of the lunar surface. Also participating via Skype was America's first woman in space, Sally Rye, whose science team participates in the Mooncam program. When I was growing up, it was really cool to be a scientist or an engineer. Kids watched the space program on TV and dreamed of building rockets to the stars or discovering life on Mars. Programs like Mooncam make science cool again. Grail Mooncam is the first planetary mission carrying instruments fully dedicated to education and public outreach. It's really a great example of what we need to be doing more of to lift our game in science and engineering and math education around the country. It is a very unique opportunity that you all have and uh, I want to thank Sally for her incredible uh, commitment. At the monthly Sunday experiment, families were able to participate in activities to explore and learn about the magnetic fields of the sun, electromagnets, and ultraviolet light. They also learned how NASA studies the sun and space weather with the Solar Dynamics Observatory satellite. Launched in February 2010, SDO is designed to help us understand the sun's influence on Earth and near-Earth space by studying the solar atmosphere on small scales of space and time and in many wavelengths simultaneously. The Ames Research Center and the Traveling Space Museum recently took the space experience on the road to motivate and inspire the next generation of explorers. During a stop at California's Fresno State University, elementary and middle school students learned about the basic principles of aeronautics and spaceflight through interactive exhibits and activities. They also heard from Ames Deputy Director Lou Braxton, an alumnus of the university, about the importance of studying science and math. Another museum event at Ronald McNair School in East Palo Alto, California, featured Cheryl McNair, widow of Challenger astronaut Ron McNair. That's what he liked to do, was, was to let people know, you can do this, try it, you can do it. And he was so happy with what he was doing that he wanted other people to be happy as well. Mrs. McNair encouraged students to study science and math and emphasized the importance of dedication and persistence in achieving one's goals. 
Ten years ago, on June 5, 2002, Space Shuttle Endeavour launched from the Kennedy Space Center on STS-111, a utilization flight to the International Space Station. The shuttle crew consisted of Commander Ken Cockrell, Pilot Paul Lockhart, and Mission Specialist Philippe Perrin of the European Space Agency, and Franklin Chang Diaz, making his seventh trip to space, tying the record set by fellow NASA astronaut Jerry Ross. Also riding uphill was the Expedition 5 crew, Peggy Whitson, the station's first female commander, and Russian cosmonauts Valery Korzun and Sergei Tresev. The mission delivered payload and experiment racks to the Destiny Laboratory and the mobile base system, completing the station's mobile servicing system, which includes the Canadarm2 and the mobile transporter. Endeavour's crew returned to Earth on June 19th, bringing with them cosmonaut Yuri Onyeferenko and NASA astronauts Dan Bursch and Carl Waltz of Expedition 4. President Obama bestowed upon former U.S. Senator and NASA astronaut John Glenn the 2012 Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award. Glenn is one of 13 Americans so honored at the White House this year for, quote, an especially meritorious contribution to the security or national interest of the United States, world peace, cultural or other significant public or private endeavors. In 1962, as one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts, Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. He's also the oldest man ever to have flown in space, doing so as a 77-year-old member of the Shuttle Discovery crew in 1998. And that's This Week in NASA. For more on these and other stories or to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or other social media, log on to www.nasa.gov.